Hi, my name is Rachel and I have a genetic connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and that has caused a lot of other conditions and problems throughout my journey but today I want to focus on a condition that I have called craniocervical instability. This is something that I get a lot of questions on and I recently had a surgery for this. So I had my skull fused down to C2 and I also had a Chiari decompression at the same time. And I wanted to address some of the questions that I've gotten on how do I get tested for craniocervical instability? How do I rule that out to make sure I don't have it? And I just thought it would be easier to make a video to explain the tests that are done for CCI and other related conditions. And before I get started on that, I just want to mention that I am, of course, not an expert on these matters at all. I've just spent a lot of time doing research on my own, and I've seen some of the top specialists on these conditions, and so I'm just sharing what I've learned so far. If I happen to get something wrong, I'm sorry, but this is what I've learned and what I want to share with you guys. So, All right, so what imaging do you need to have done to test for craniocervical instability? The first and most important imaging that you need to have done is an upright MRI with flexion and extension. And that means the MRI is done when you're sitting in a chair and it'll take it while you're just sitting straight up and then they'll take more images as you put your chin to your chest and you tip your head back. The issue with the upright MRI is they are few and far in between and sometimes insurance doesn't want to cover the upright MRIs and sometimes doctors don't know how to order them right. That's kind of the struggle with being tested for CCI is that you really need to go to one of these neurosurgeons that knows what they're doing. And I think there's four that I know of in the United States and then there's one in Spain. And I'll put a list below of the doctors that are specialized in CCI if you want to check that out. And then the next uh, important scan that is done is to test for something called lantoaxial instability which often occurs with craniocervical instability and lantoaxial instability is the instability of your C1 and C2 and your C1 and C2 are responsible for rotating your head and so the doctor is going to need to order something called a rotational CT scan which is pretty simple and can be done in a normal CT ma machine while you're laying down. And all that happens is you get a CT scan of you looking all the way to the left and all the way to the right. And then they'll be able to look on the scan and see if your C1, C2 are subluxing when you move your head. And so that was the case for me. And I also had the craniocervical instability, but a lot of times when you have connective tissue disorders, your instability is not just in the craniocervical area. It can go down your neck and further down your spine. And so that's the trouble with having these surgeries is that we really don't know like what the outcome is going to be long term, but they definitely are necessary for some people and they definitely help some people a lot. So it's just something to really take seriously and to not just have surgery without thinking it through and without really deciding if it's worth the risk. Another question I've gotten is, what if my doctor told me that I don't have craniocervical instability? Usually that's a neurologist or a neurosurgeon. And I'm sorry to tell you that most, and I mean most, neurologists and neurosurgeons are not aware of craniocervical instability. They do not test for it on MRIs and they often miss it. A lot of times, once people are diagnosed with CCI, they've seen a lot of different neurosurgeons and these doctors don't know how to help these people and they don't know what's wrong. And so it often takes people a long time to find answers and Craniocervical instability is something that, unfortunately, you really need to see a specialist to know if you have it or not. And that can be a big problem because it's expensive. Not 
everyone has the money to do that and most of the doctors that are aware are private doctors that only accept out of network insurance and so it can become really difficult but I have known some people who have done fundraisers for their appointments and their upright MRIs if they aren't able to afford that. Okay sorry I just had to put on my neck brace. I'm trying to wean off of wearing my neck brace and to not wear as much as I can but it really does feel a lot better still with it on. Another question that I've gotten a lot is will craniocervical instability show on a supine MRI and the answer is sometimes. My supine MRI did show my craniocervical instability. It showed something called a retroflexed odontoid, which is a sign, as well as a kyphotic cleboaxial angle. I'll go into that more in a minute here, but yes, you can have a normal supine MRI and still have craniocervical instability. It's really important to see what your neck is doing when you're moving. This is just me popping in from the future to say that your supine MRI could show instability if you do have it, even if your doctor did say that it was normal. I would go as far to say that most neurosurgeons, doctors that don't specialize in craniocervical instability specifically are not aware of it and will not see it on an MRI, which is definitely concerning, but it's, it's the truth, so I just wanted to throw that out there. So what measurements are important with imaging done to assess for craniocervical instability. One of the first ones is called the cliboaxial angle, and that is just basically a measure to show and indicate brainstem compression. It's considered to be pathological for craniocervical instability if it's less than 135 degrees, and normal is typically around 150 degrees, and so anything less than 135 is considered pathological and something that would be considered for surgery if needed. Surgery is always a last resort. So there are people that have very low cleaval axial angles that are able to prevent having surgery. And so just because you have a low cleaval axial angle doesn't necessarily mean that surgery is the right choice for you, but it does show that you have pathological measurements to indicate surgery if and when it's needed. So I'm looking over my report here from one of my appointments. Okay, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but the next one is a grab oaks measurements. I found a definition for the grab oaks measurement online, and it says it's a line drawn from the basion to the inferior posterior C2. And then a perpendicular line is drawn from the center of this line to the dura of the brainstem. A, a grab oaks measurement greater than 9 millimeters denotes a form of basilar invagination. And so this measurement is helpful for knowing how much your retroflexed odontoid is compressing your brainstem. And the retroflexed odontoid is something that I'll put a picture of up here so you can kind of see what I mean. The next important measurement is the horizontal Harris measurement and that is measured when your neck is in flexion and in extension and then I believe they look at the difference between those two measurements to see if like your skull is kind of loose and moving too much when you move your head and that is another sign of craniocervical instability. And the last thing that my doctor did was he measured the angulation of my vertebra and my neck going down in flexion and that showed that I had instability down to about C6 and so I could have had surgery where they fused my skull from the top to C6 but we opted to do the least amount possible and hope to avoid surgery with things like physical therapy and prolotherapy. I'll go into that more a different day. Another thing that a craniocervical instability specialist will do is that they will do a full neurological assessment with reflexes and pinpricks and testing your gag reflex and whatnot. People with craniocervical instability often don't have a gag reflex. I did not. Um, we also often have reduced sensitivity to pinpricks. So 
when you're pricked with a, a needle, it should hurt, but often we feel a dull poke, something that doesn't hurt, or nothing at all. And then the other is differences in your reflexes. I had hyperactive reflexes in my legs and I think underactive reflexes in my arms. I don't know if that's the way it is for most people with craniocervical instability or not, but my surgeon did say that that was consistent with what the imaging showed. So, thought I'd throw that in there. Another question that I have been asked is, what if I got the imaging report back from my MRI and it said it was normal? That is another thing that often happens for those of us with craniocervical instability. Your neurosurgeon that specializes in CCI will disregard whatever the report says and he'll make his own measurements and decide for himself what he thinks or she thinks. So I also wanted to share that there are a lot of other conditions that can mimic the symptoms of craniocervical instability. So if it ends up that you don't have craniocervical instability, that's probably a good thing because it's not something that you want to have, although answers are important and I know that it is really comforting and important to find answers, but I will say that craniocervical instability is not something that you want to have. There's no perfect fix. It's it's a difficult journey and it's a tough road and those of you that have it know that. <laughs> but some other conditions that may have similar symptoms are intracranial hypertension, cerebrospinal fluid leaks, uh, Chiari malformation, tethered cord syndrome. If you guys can think of any more, please let me know. But I do have to mention that those conditions can all occur with craniocervical instability and some of us are lucky enough to have them all. I just would definitely recommend that before you have treatment for one of those conditions to if at all possible to be tested for all those other things just so that you can see the complete picture and know what's going on and I know how difficult it is to have that done these doctors are very busy they have long waits it's expensive and a lot of people can't afford it and Honestly, that breaks my heart, and I really, really hope that as we continue to spread awareness for these conditions, that more doctors will become interested and want to learn more about it and learn how to treat it because that's important. And there's so many people out there that need help and they haven't been able to get it. And these conditions are just debilitating. They are so, so hard to live with. And to think that, you know, some people have to wait months and years for the treatment they need is just not right. And I hope, I sincerely hope that that will change in the future and that more awareness will be made for these conditions that are so very real and debilitating and even in rare cases can be life-threatening. So. Anyways, I hope that this was helpful in some way, and I wish you all the best of luck in your journey to find answers for whatever you're going through. Just remember that you're not alone, and I'm rooting for you. Bye, guys.